Good morning, good morning. Let's try this again, this time with the microphone plugged in. <laughs> Sorry about that, gang. So... <laughs> you didn't actually need me to say anything, because everybody knows what I'm going to say anyway, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. I totally forgot to set the microphones up. Got the two cameras ready, got everything else ready, got my plan ready, and forgot to get the microphone up. up. I think it's okay now, right? Mushy mushy microphone. Hi, hey, okay. Sorry about that. Actually, a lot of the setting here is a bit funny. The, the, the lights are in a different place. Uh, there was video recording here last night, just at this bench, not for a video of mine. But uh, is he here this morning? Is uh, Sensei Martian, is he here? He came over yesterday evening after the shop was closed, set up his cameras and stuff, and we recorded a bit of a conversation together. Not for, for one of my videos, but for a video on his side. So everything's all a bit mixed up here right now. So. <laughs> I don't know if he's here yet. Uh, good morning, Sensei, Sensei Margin, Sensei Margin. Yeah, it was fun last night, sir, I know, but I have mixed feelings after, you know. As I said, the sensei here was over for, for our conversation, and I, I maybe when there's a, when there's an actual interview happening, you know, people ask, "Can we have an interview?" And they come, and there's a reporter with a notepad and stuff like this, and there's a cameraman, and it's an actual formal interview. We know how it works. They've got a bunch of questions. They've done some research, and they, they poke me with some questions, and I answer as best I can. But last night, the session with, uh, with uh, Sensei Margin, it was different. It wasn't supposed to be that kind of interview. I guess he wanted to, to just talk about things and, and whatever. But I don't really know sort of what for or what format this is going to be. So it wasn't an interview so much as it was a conversation. So I wasn't, you know, whatever. We had a conversation. He's easy to talk to. We just chatted and talked for a while. But after it was over and he left, I sat there thinking, you know, I wonder, you know, this conversation, he recorded it. He's going to put it in his YouTube channel. But because I had the feeling of it was an informal and quite relaxed conversation with a friend, I may have been a bit too informal. He can speak up here or not as he, as he chooses. But uh, So after, after he left, I thought, geez, I was too informal there. You know, I punched him on the shoulder once or said something like, uh, what did I say? Don't interrupt me. I can't forget what I said. I don't know. <laughs> but it's stuff that in a, in a friendly conversation with a friend was okay. But seen cold later on on a YouTube channel, it might, it might look like I'm a bit of a jerk. I don't know. <laughs> it's, anyway, it's up to him to what he does with it. So. <laughs> He'll do a compilation of all the bad parts. Yeah, that's right. Make me look like uh, whatever. Anyway. So. Okay, as you can see, we are still carving. And as you can see, if you were here the other day, I've got some progress made. Where did we leave it the other day? I think I was part way through one of the bamboo screens here. Well, yesterday morning before the shop opened, it was quiet down here and I got going. 
I didn't get my swim yesterday. Yesterday was a national holiday here in Japan. I forget what day. Oh, yeah, it's the first day of spring, whatever, national holiday. So the pool was closed, and the shop didn't open until 9.30. So I had a couple of hours to kill. So I went at some of this carving. So let's keep at it. Let's get going here. Also, too, I broke my knife yesterday. I know, you, you know the story here. This wood, obviously, I'll show you when it was new. There was a huge knot in the middle here. And that's one reason I chose it for this piece, because the knot in the middle would render it useless for, for most uses. And it, the knot wasn't exactly where the lines are. And in general, the wood near a knot like this is quite hard which is what I want for a key block like this. But it's rock hard. It's just like, like carving metal or carving concrete, the area near that. So I was just coming along here and I broke it. So it's all, it's all sharper. We're back to normal now, but I, I did break it off yesterday. So. Yeah, you can see the shine. That's right. The, 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 the chisel, when the chisel knocks across this, it just leaves an incredible shine. Okay, let's uh, dig in here, get to work. Yeah, that's right, and somebody's adding here, so the, the grain direction. Each block has its own overall grain direction. The grain might be going this way or that way, and we learn when using our chisels which way to work with the grain. You can sometimes see it at the end of the block at the edge. You can see that the, the grain falls down, and you can know which way to move your chisel by looking at these lines. But in the area around a knot like this, all bets are off. The grain patterns become very localized. And the chisel might want to go okay here, but here it's backwards, it's okay here. It's just it's just almost completely random. So that's why you see some of the feathering here. Because what I did was to clear this off, I would have last night tried to go this way, it didn't work. Turn it around, try to go this way, it didn't work. So for that area, you just go across the grain. It's not the way you normally want to do it, but it doesn't cause any problems. It doesn't leave a nice surface, but we don't care down there. Okay, let's get some lines cut. Someone's asking, any news about the ninja store next door who wanted to force their employees to dress like ninjas? We've got the story scrambled there, you know. It wasn't the ninja store next door that was talking about that. The ninja store across the street, the boys do dress up as ninjas, of course. That's their shtick. What we were talking about was the beef restaurant, the Wagyu restaurant next door. And the, the Tencho-san, the, the owner-manager, I don't know which it is, he mentioned to me that they were trying to have their employees wear ninja uniforms. It was going to be their shtick for the beef restaurant. And all I heard was that the employees really didn't want to go along with this, and I, since then, I've heard nothing. So I think simply it was an idea that they floated, got canned, and I think don't think we'll hear any more about it. But it was a beef restaurant. It wasn't a ninja store. There are also, I don't know if you guys know about this, there are more uh, attractions and stuff opening up here in the Asakusa area. Now that the tourist, uh, tourist boom is in full swing again, there are new things happening around here. And over on Kokusai Dori, down to the southwest of us here, there is another major, major ninja attraction. A much more sophisticated large-scale one, specifically aimed at foreign tourists. The little ninja thing across the street here really is just for little uh, Japanese preschool kids. It's a, it's a mini ninja. In the evening they become a bar, which is not for preschool kids, but but that's a different story. But the ninja experience over on Kokusai Dori, I forget what they call it, it's, it's quite more sophisticated. It's expensive, uh, it's got different levels of participation, and one thing they are advertising is your chance to use a real Japanese sword. The ninja place across the street here uses plastic stuff for swinging around, but that place over on Kokusai Dori has, I haven't seen them, but they're saying, real 
I'm going to put air quotes, wheel, swords. And they've set up straw, uh, you know, the straw columns and straw dummy humans and whatever. And as part of the experience, I guess they train you first what to do. People get to slice with a sword some of these uh, straw dummies or whatever. And that's expensive. It's uh, 12,000 yen or something like that. I don't have a link. I'm sorry. But if you Google Asakusa Ninja Sword, whatever, the place will come up. And I sure hope their insurance policies are, uh, are sophisticated and up to date, because I don't know if I want to get close to a bunch of tourists who have maybe just come off a lunch, maybe a liquid lunch, I don't know, <laughs> swinging around some real swords. I would presume it's all very, very carefully organized and regulated, but one never knows, do one. The other new attraction, and this has opened up just, uh, I think it opened up in late February, is uh, an evening uh, theater dance show. And these are people that were in business before the pandemic. I think they were over in Nopongi area. Pandemic killed them, they staggered for a while, and they have now come back to life in Asaksa. They also have a website, an English website, and if you Google for Asaksa Kagua, can I? Kagawa? Ka Kagua. Just let me put the words in here. If you Google, oops, the English here. Kagua, is that right? Somebody will, will correct me if I'm wrong. And it's an evening. Uh, you know, it's, it's a cabaret, mm, whatever. There's tables and chairs, and they serve drinks and snacks. There's no meals. It's not dinner. And there's some couches there. If you pay extra, you can sit on a couch instead of a table. And the stage is there. And there's a, like, 60, 80-minute 80 uh, minute show. And it's, it's not ballet. It's modern dance. But it's, it's, it's people wearing kimonos and, and f throwing themselves around and flashing lights and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Neo-contemporary I, I forget what they call it. And it's expensive. Know, to get in, the cheap price, cheapest price is about 4,000 yen. I think 6,000 yen is a little bit the normal seat. And then you pay a, a seat charge. And some of the seat charges are there in five figures, and it doesn't start with one at the beginning. It's, it's an expensive place. So bit by bit, with the resumption of full tourism in Japan, the culture is changing and things are coming, uh, things are developing here. This has been a complaint for, for a long time. Well, forever this has been a complaint from foreigners about Japan, is that there's no night stuff in the sense of, like when you go to New York, there's, there's Broadway and, uh, and London as well. There are shows to go to. And there are clubs and stuff. Japan has clubs, but they're they're really not aimed at uh, at foreigners. It's you know the, the dance clubs for for young girls and stuff. And Tokyo really doesn't have any kind of sophisticated uh, nightlife. But maybe now, maybe this is now going to start to change. I don't know. I think we need to sharpen here. The, the very tip of the blade is gone here. I broke it last night down in the hard place. Then I sharpened up and made a nice shape again. But somehow, last night when I was still carving, and the tip is gone, the very tip is gone. So to do nice work like this, let's, so let's sharpen. Let's put a bad blade in it, on it. So somebody said they're shocked that Asakusa is dead at midnight on a weekend. It's, it's just the way it is. You know, maybe the trains here don't run all night either. 
the last train in some places is might sit like around midnight or something is the last train in many places. And that's on the table too. I've read stories about that, that the, the government and whatever is in discussions with the train companies to, to try and change all this, to try and... Uh, uh, if they're going to open more bars and theaters and nightclubs and stuff, then you need a way for people to get home. And either it will have to be uh, taxi fleets or more trains. But uh, so I don't know what's going to what's going to come of it all. Mokanka Nightlife. You know, we talked about this back before the pandemic when we were up and running. We were doing our print parties. And this was actually an idea on the table for, for serious consideration. Our print parties, this is back, whatever, 20, 2016, 2017, whatever. Our print parties were doing fine, but there was demand for them that we couldn't fill just during the daytime, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock. So the idea was on the table to do a 6 o'clock print party, one hour, and then at 7 o'clock take the customers out to a local bar here. There's people that would like to experience a Japanese bar, but were a bit uh, maybe not sure if they can go in there by themselves and stuff. So print party plus izakaya was an idea here. This is a 400 grit stone. Because I'm shaping metal here, we've got two sides to this stone, 400 and 1,000. But because I want to take off metal here, because that tip is broken, I'll use this stronger stone here. It's a 400. And in order to keep myself flat, to keep that bevel flat, my hand is running on the table. I'm not doing this free hand. I've locked the knife in place and my hand is sliding on the table here. Yeah, that was another idea. So a nighttime print party, print the octopus and then go to a bar, you know. We didn't do it, of course, none of us here. It would be fun once or twice, but can you imagine every day going out to a bar next door with some of the customers? I mean, <laughs> That's not the life I wanted to plan for myself, so. There's a strong burr on this now, so first I'm going to pull the burr off the back on the 1000 plate. And now we do 1,000 on the bevel. This is an old Nagura stone, if you haven't seen this before. It's not really needed on these nice new diamond plates, but it's just, I like it, I like it, I like it. Again, hand is running on the table here. This, these little diamond plates are so easy to use. Your hand runs on the table, just get your angle right, ready, Ready, set, hold the plate, and away we go. And we're not shaping the blade at this point, we're just taking out the scratches from the previous stone. Lighten up. A 
and I think we are almost done. We could use it just like that. Now we could take that knife and stick it in the wood and it would cut very nicely. But we're going to go one more. We'll go to our finishing stone. And for this I use this, the old fashioned one. There's no real reason. I should get a diamond stone that's a very fine grind just to keep it all consistent. But I'm trying to hang on to some last remnants of, of tradition here. <laughs> I have no idea what grit this is. Many thousands. It just feels like a piece of marble, actually. And if I didn't use this nagara, it wouldn't do anything. The knife would just slide back and forth on it. And I'm told, and I guess it seems right, that the, the mud that has come from the surface of that nagara is the thing that's actually doing the, the polishing here. So yeah, so it's a three-stage process on the times when you need to change the shape of the knife, as in when you have a broken tip. And it would be a two-stage process if not. I would start with the 1000 and then go to the polishing stone. And then again, on the back here, I'm going to lift it up. I'll exaggerate first. I'm going to lift it up like this, but not that far. Lift it up just a tiny bit. One, two strokes. And that takes away the, the absolute sharpest edge on the knife. It actually dulls it a bit. And it leaves, we're going to be able to see this. It's here, you can see it there. See the back? There's the main flat back of the blade. You can see it's hollow ground. And then I'll try and find the shiny thing. There it is. You can see the shininess. That's another bevel. That's a small, tiny bevel on the back of the blade that I put on by lifting it up and moving it forward. And there's the main front bevel. Should we zoom in? the main front bevel, the back hollow ground, and you can see, and there's the little flat bevel just at the edge. Good, a couple of minutes of work. Okay.
<laughs> that Hoxai series that sold that news that you're talking about there. It's a little bit funny, you know, they sold for, what was it? I forget the final total, three, three point something million dollars? I don't know. Three point something million, I can't remember what it was, but actually the gentleman who was putting it up for auction, I think he spent just about that much putting that collection together. This is a bit of a strange story here, I know. The place he was using as a dealer that was mentioned in one of the stories there is a major Tokyo dealer here. It's not one of the dealers that we recommend to people. When the people come in our shop here, uh, they sometimes enjoy the prints that we've got, but quite often there are people who are coming here, and it turns out they're looking for more original ukiyo-e prints. There are people coming in here, they think we're an actual uh, old-fashioned print shop, and we're not. We have prints that we sell, or that we make ourselves, and we have a selection of things like the 20th century Adachi reproductions, things like that, from which many visitors to Japan like to pick up. But we're not an actual old, old dealer in old prints. We don't have old, original Hiroshikis and Hokusai here, stuff like that. There are a few dealers downtown who do carry that sort of thing. So when people come here and ask us where they should go to look for that sort of thing, we, we recommend a couple of the different shops. And we've got a little, uh, it's printed out. We keep it behind the counter, a little piece of note paper, because we, we end up recommending the same thing and the same thing instead of drawing the map all the time. We've got a little printout. So when people ask us where to go, to get prints like that, we pull out the little sheet behind the counter. We say, here you go. There's two shops Dave is recommending. One is uh, Yamade Shoten in Jimbocho, and the other is Harashobo, also in Jimbocho, just uh, one minute apart. But in the news stories about that gentleman who, was, who, had, who had built up that Hokusai set, it mentions the name of the dealer that he used here in Tokyo that helped him put the thing together, and it was a, a different dealer one that we don't actually recommend to our uh, to our visitors here because that dealer his prices are what would you say optimistic let's say there his prices are optimistic he has a new york office also not just the tokyo office and i guess his main clientele are things like stockbrokers who just got their yearly bonus and stuff like that they've come in to get a an original ukiyo print to put on their wall and they can show off how much they paid for it. I mean, there is a market for stuff like that. People who have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of disposable income and they would like to have a, an original Japanese woodba print on their wall and guests come over for a drink and the guy can say, it cost me one and a half million and everybody will appropriately go, ooh, ah, wow. That is a thing that's a market. And this other dealer in, in Tokyo here, he specializes in this market. So when I read in the story that that gentleman who had put together the full set of Hokusai prints, that was his source. Okay, whatever, that's his choice. He, he got what he wanted. He got a bunch of really expensive prints, and they are really expensive prints. But uh, when you add it all up, he must have paid easily three million more for that set of prints that he's got. And to hear it now sells for $3.6 million, I really don't think it's, he, there's a big profit here. I don't know the numbers. I'm just guessing on what's happened here by looking at this. So this is an interesting thing that somebody has put together all these prints, uh, whether they're all originals or how many might be forgeries. I have no, no knowledge whatsoever. But there's no thing here where somebody built a little collection, spending just a tiny bit of money, and then made a fortune. That's not what's happened here. I don't know the, the real numbers, because I don't know what he paid for all these things, but uh, that's the kind of story that we're seeing here. It's funny that the media would run with this. Uh, There was also a photograph accompanying one of the stories I read, which showed, I think it was 12 of the prints in frames on a wall. And when you looked at those prints in that image, those actually didn't look like old Hoxai prints completely. They looked like modern reproductions. And what the gentleman may be doing, I think, he may also have uh, reproductions, and those are what he's using for display. 
and then keeping the real prints uh, in the back room or undercover. Uh, there's a bunch of funny things mixed together in this story. And, uh, I'm not going to say the prints that just sold for three million dollars were reproductions, but he has got some reproductions there. That's what we saw in the pictures. So, so I don't know. There's a bunch of twists in that story. I don't know what they are. Oh, Jacques is here. Good morning, Jacques. -san. We got some facts. Okay, he bought them for 3.3 million euros and sold them for 3.6 million euros. You go, there you are. I think I think that's what's happened there. So, <laughs> I guess he had fun collecting them over years. Whatever. Thanks, Jacques. -san. Thank you. I'm sorry not to have got moving on your your book collection yet. It's you know what's happening here. So I will I will try and get going on that soon. Yeah, they buy that. If he sold it for 3.6, what's the auction house? It's going to take a cut there. I don't know. There's an auction premium or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny to think of this. I'm doing the work on this block, and it's a very, very rare case for us. This block is actually not going to be used to make many prints. Uh, we don't do limited editions here at Mokahankan, of course. For this very reason, there's so much work in doing the carving and getting it all ready that it makes no sense for us to then throw away the blocks. You know. But this one is going to be, in a sense, a limited edition, although, although we're not going to, to call it that. This is for the share certificate for 2025 that we give to, to Patriot supporters at a certain level. And there will only, there's only a few dozen of those. So this print is going to be, we're going to make a few dozen prints from this. They will go out to those uh, so supporters and then that's it. The block will then get tossed aside. The prints we use for the Patreon campaign, the ones that are at the Nenga level, the, what we call Nenga, it's like a New Year card. Those go to other people as well, because we use our normal New Year card for that. So when we make a print for a New Year card here in Japan, we do it and send it out on New Year's Day to people within Japan, our you know, clients and business people we deal with, the papermaker and stuff like that. We have to send a New Year greeting to them. So we use that card for that. And then over the course of the next 12 months, that same print goes to our Patreon supporters month by month as what we call the Nenga level of support. And then after that, the blocks are used for our normal Mokohankan catalog. So the New Year's card for any given year is then used for Patreon people for the next year. And following that, it just goes into our normal catalog as an open catalog item. The Patreon chibis that we use, they, uh, we make about five or 600 of each of those. And to date, we have never ever issued them other than in Patreon. We don't use them in our normal catalog. People ask about that all the time. Can I get those cute little Patreon chibi prints? And up to date, and for the moment, we have no plans whatsoever to issue them separately from that, that, that source. 
and this one too, the share certificate, it goes to the Patreon people and then just sets aside. It would make no sense to use it as a catalog item. So. so this work that I'm doing, it's going to be for a print that will go to, I don't know, I, I don't know the current count, 30 people maybe. So it's a bit unusual for us. You know. I'm okay with this. It's worth me doing the work for this. Those very, very good supporters helping us very, very much. So I'm not bitching about this. I've got to do all this work and just make 25 prints. It's, you know, it helps uh, make something special. You know. of wood you know did, did you notice already the tip of the knife is already gone did anybody notice that or can you not see it at the current magnification Did anybody notice it? You see, it's not quite a point anymore. It's a little bit of a straight line. So what we're going to do, we're going to try something interesting here. It's hard to explain. Let me get a piece of paper and try and draw what I mean here. Let's try this. Here's a... Okay, there's a, oops, there's a quote, perfect knife. This is the, the bevel side like this. Over on the back side, if we imagine we're looking at the back side, remember I put that little, little bevel on the back, just like this. I cut the bevel on the back so that that edge wasn't quite so sharp. But as I started carving now, a few minutes, what's happened is actually the very top of the knife disappeared here. It didn't actually like, break something like this, chop off, but the very tip of it did stay there in the wood. So I guess it broke off a little bit. So what I'm going to do, instead of going back to the stone and sharpening it again and pulling it all back and making a new edge here, you know, you pull it back and pull it back. That would give me a new corner. What I'm going to do, I'll show you again. If you imagine that's gone there. If that tip is gone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it back to the stone and I'm going to knock off this part. Now, I could have done that actually at the beginning and probably knowing how hard this wood is, that's what I should have done when you saw me sharpen a couple of minutes ago. If Taransan is watching here this morning, he's probably not, he's probably too busy. But if he were watching this morning, he would have expected me to first sharpen the bevel and then go and take the burr off the back and then put that little extra bevel and he would then have expected me to go on the stone like you're going to see me in a couple of minutes now and knock off the very tip and what that does that leaves you with a knife now that looks like this so this part is gone this this little area here is gone we still have a nice sharp tip but the rate, the, the, what's it called? The angle here inside the knife now is a bit more obtuse. If we had done it this level, that angle would have been more acute. And it's less likely to break in areas where you're going to get in trouble. Now, if we did it too much, can you imagine if we knocked it off like this? You don't even have an angle anymore. You've got a right angle. So you can't do this too much. You've got to be careful with how you do it. But it does save you a bit of, uh, gives a bit of leeway on this. So that's what we're going to do now, what I could have done a few minutes ago. We're going to get the stone out for a second here. And we're going to 
knock off that back tip. That's a wrong angle for you guys to see it. Let's see, something like this. That's restored actually to point. We now have a point again, sharp, sharp. It's not, this, it's not as acute as it was a minute ago. It's a little bit more obtuse, but it is now back to being a point again. If you lift up too much this way, you're going to get your, your right angle. You've got to keep it down, down, down. Shoi, 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 question. Did the old carvers also use lenses for their work? Well, before lenses were invented, of course, no. We don't have documentation on this. There's an image in the Hokusai manga, and this would be middle 1800s, of a carver hunched over a bench with a little pair of round goggles. So we know that's, that there were some kind of glasses or lenses in place in the middle 1800s. When's the Hokusai manga? Earlier than that, 1820 or something, I don't know. As far as things like a microscope, no, of course not. Whether they then would have had something like this. I have a desk lens that I use, which really, really helps quite a lot sometimes. It's in between the glasses and the microscope. We don't know. We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Starting in the late Meiji with some of the Yoshitoshi stuff, the hairlines do show, start to show a very mechanical approach sometimes. They're incredibly tiny and thin and long and long and long. And I kind of find it hard to believe that that would really be possible without some kind of assistance with a lens. But that's just me. I don't know. Also, somebody's got this once, once a carver, once he starts to get, like, to my position. If this was now, if we didn't have the scope, I would not be able to do this job. I can't. My, my, my normal focus is getting difficult, and the glaucoma is, is really, you know, getting, uh, starting to take over my right eye. So if, if I were in a larger workshop, I, at my age now, I would be sitting in one corner. I would be banging the persuader all day. There's no way they would be uh, having me do this kind of work. Absolutely not. If it wasn't for having this uh, physical help. So I'm saying, do we stack two blades together? This is interesting. In the engraving world, they do this. They carve, they have parallel blades together, parallel burans together, and they do, they carve parallel lines in a group. I'm not aware of anybody doing that when we're carving on the plank with knives. I don't know if that would be possible. Somebody's outside, did you say? I don't, uh, I missed that, I'm sorry, I don't see anybody. Hmm. Less fear of breaking now. a hard piece of wood. Boy, oh boy. That's the knot, you know, we're in the knot zone here. This is one brittle hard piece of wood.
We do, of course, uh, have a show and tell today. Uh, there's a bunch of different things we can use. Uh, maybe there might be a tad disappointment at the moment. At the end of the last show and tell, I showed you those Otsu A pictures. And I promised that when we came back the next day, meaning today, I would have some more background information for you. I haven't had time to do that, I'm sorry. So I do want to do it, and I'm not going to just drop the topic. But I don't have that ready today. So we'll have to postpone that part of it. So what we'll do is I'll keep those pictures. There, they're right here, those Otsu A pictures. They're right here on my desk. I'll keep them here to remind me that I do have to get something ready for that. But we won't be doing that part of it today. So today we'll look at something else. There's still unopened packages clustered all around my desk. So we'll open something else today. And I will try and get back to that topic, I'm sorry. It is interesting. You can blame Jason. I didn't have time last night. <laughs> Keep pummeling the guy. Also hungry, hungry, hungry. Ate light last night. Didn't get any breakfast yet this morning. Can I survive until lunchtime? I don't know. Coming along, looking good, it's looking good. <coughs> There's too many questions here. Questions, questions, questions. Mm -hmm. They're fast in the mornings. No, I normally at six o'clock when I get up, I have a little half cup of coffee or something, maybe a biscuit or whatever, but not today I didn't. I don't have a full breakfast, just like I said, a small little light cup of uh, milk coffee and then uh, a piece of something from 7-Eleven, a piece of a bun or something. But I can't, I can't eat a full breakfast before going to the pool and swimming. But today I had nothing. It was up and run and run and run, so I've had nothing.
Ah, I'm missing, missing questions here. I'm sorry. But, uh, whatever. We'll give her time, are we? That's right. Yeah, I understand she'll be walking in in a few minutes, I guess. She was off yesterday. Yesterday was a national holiday, so uh, all the office staff was gone, were gone yesterday. So any, anybody that put orders in or something, they haven't heard from, from us. There was no shipping. Post office was closed. So the shop was buzzing, as in capital B-U-Z-Z. -Z. It was very, very busy in the shop yesterday. So the staff will all be back today. Uh, so I understand. I think she'll be around here at nine o'clock, somewhere just before nine, saying hello. The wood here is not even like wood. That's the knot, which is, is whatever it's like, rosin or something. But all the wood near here is very, very hard and brittle. It's very possible we're going to pop this knife here. Mm. Am I using a right hand hangi on my left hand? Yes, exactly. We've talked about this many, 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 many times. This is a right-handed knife. The blade is beveled the way that you see. The traditional carver, who is a right-handed person, would put his hand over the blade. He would look over his head, 
over his hand and he would carve this way with the blade on here the blade on the line to be retained and then he would make the relief cut this way dave here is using the knife under my nose i'm not over the back of my hand i'm using it under my nose so doing it the same way i keep the flat of the blade on the line to be retained and then make the relief cut this way so yes left-handed person using a right-handed knife. If I were starting again, if I were, you know, 20 again or whatever, starting out, I would absolutely take the time and trouble to carve the proper way. I would get a left-handed knife. I would carve over the back of my hand. Much more difficult at first, but much more effective in the long run once you've got it, once you've got yourself trained. Taran San, our young friend from the UK, he's doing it that way. Of course, he's, he's doing it the proper way. And uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the career or whatever, <laughs> in the long run, he will, uh, if he's got the good skill set, he will be a very, very, very fine carver. You know? Oh, 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 here we go. Good morning, morning good morning. So sorry. Huh? Pardon me? I'm late today. Late? Is anybody, is anybody clocking you? <laughs> well, I think they're taking the time. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, the train was uh, off, is it? Oh, well, the trains were delayed, and then when oh. the, the first train came, it was packed. Ah, so I was you, like, oh, I don't So you let one train. go by. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm you, scared you, now. Sorry, this train. Yeah, I need a... Oh, yeah, you need some space. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. That's your excuse and you're sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's really you're, bad. Um, uh, Tokyo, when Tokyo line, Tokashi, Shinjuku line. That's, really? Yeah, they, you, you mean was, crowding, you mean? Crowded, yeah, yeah in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Like, metro is not as, uh, as can't, bad can't as... can't quite see it. Okay. JR trains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saito is the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What station do you come from? What days did you get on? What's your starting station? Uh, Akabane. Akabane, okay, station, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're not coming from outside the suburbs, you're still basically inside Tokyo. Inside yeah, yeah. Tokyo, but that's the uh, station next to Saitama. Mm. So people commuting from Saitama. Yeah, so it's a major change station. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so when you're getting on, that train's already full. Already yeah, full. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so. Especially when trains are delayed, you know, yep. they're already yep. packed. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. And I understand, obviously, she doesn't want to jam into a train where people are really squeezing up really tight, obviously. Right. Common sense, right. common sense, yeah. So, so. Yeah, and when trains are already packed, you know, this maternity badge doesn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> Nobody like, can see anything, yeah, yeah, of seat. course. Well, I don't need a yeah, seat, you know, just yeah, give me a little yeah, space. Yeah, so. yeah, and that's the thing. There is, like, like I said, there's a mark that women are wearing now to, to let people know that they're, uh, they're, they're pregnant and obviously give them a bit of space. But when it's all, when you're jammed up like <laughs> yeah. sardines, obviously it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Thank you.
yeah. the only thing then is, do you want to think about this? Actually, I never thought about this. Do you want to shift time? You know, do you, do you want to do a time shifting thing and come later than I, rush hour? I thought about it too, but like, I kind of want to... We were open at, you know, those emails from the orders over there yesterday don't have to be answered exactly at 9 o'clock this morning, really. Right, right. But I don't want to delay my walk schedule. I mean, like, I want to go at least, like, I want to go home at 6 mm, at the mm, latest. Mm. But whatever, I, I mean. I don't want to make it to, to 7. I know, but if this is not safe and if it's dangerous for you and not comfortable, let's think about a way we can be flexible here, right. you know, whatever. I don't cut back and, and, I don't know, whatever, you know, I'm open to suggestions, well, absolutely. I'm fine so far, but like when, you know, when it comes As to As it gets also, moving on, know, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. Do, I don't know what to do. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, oh. let's be flexible. There's no law that says you must be here at 9 o'clock every day if that's when the trains are really crowded. Of course, common yeah, sense. Thank you for saying this. Yeah. No, of course, common sense. I'm sorry not to think about it earlier. No, 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 so baby on board, you need a big sign. So baby, <laughs> baby on board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be after the pandemic, it was supposed to be lots of people working at home. And it was in the beginning, it was really terrible for the train companies because they're not allowed to change their schedules and they're not allowed to change their prices. It's all regulated by the ministries. So when people stopped coming to work because of the pandemic, the train company had to run all the trains the same schedule and charge the same prices. Right. And over time, they could be making adjustments, mm -hmm. but it, there isn't really a massive move to working at home. There is, there is some. There's more than there was before, but there's no massive cultural shift. I read newspaper stories about San Francisco, New York, where there's empty offices and the hot dog vendors on the street are going bankrupt because there's not enough office workers and stuff. I don't think that's happening here. Yeah. Is Maranucci well, empty these days? I don't think so. People I think it's back, in, back, you know, back to it's back its harness, you know, back in the saddle. Yeah. I think. You know. At least there are less people now in late March because uh, you know this oh, yeah. graduated. Right now, of course, March and April are different. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so. Yeah, April. May, yeah, yeah. yeah. March and April are the times in Japan where people change jobs. Nothing here is changing at Moko Hong Kong, but if you're working for a bank or something, shuffling and stuff happens in March, you will be posted to a different thing. Maybe people will do one job for two or three years commonly, and there will be a shuffle up and they will change to different stuff. Mm -hmm. The guy who swims at the pool, uh, I'm in lane three with my pace lady. She passed me twice today. The guy in lane four, he's way, way faster than me. He's a, he's a super fast guy. He talked to us uh, this morning. He said, sorry guys, uh, I'm out of here. I won't be back next month. And we're all, awesome. no, are you quitting? You can't be, you're, you're one, one. He said, no, 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 no. Tanshi and Funin. He's got a three-year posting to Chitose in Hokkaido. So, so his, his company has told him, this is not even his choice, his company has told him, for the next three years, you're going to work in the Hokkaido office. And what will happen in Japan is his family, his wife and kids, will stay here because the kids are in school, they got friends, his wife maybe has a part-time job, everybody's happy. Nobody will move. He will go by himself for three years to Hokkaido. And they will provide a, a shine deal. They show they will provide a company dormitory for him, and he will be allowed. Allowed. They will pay him an allowance to come back once a month. What's a typical an amount? What do you think? I'm not quite sure. I don't know. He'll get a he'll get a travel allowance once a month or something to come back. You know, on a weekend to to meet his family and stuff. Even the FedEx lady, she was uh, relocated. Yeah, to, relocated. Uh, you know, relocated so, to so. Osaka. I was surprised yeah. like even a woman, you know, got relocated. Yeah. Yeah, and they do this. Often to yeah. men more. Mm -hmm. Typical for salary men to happen, yes. <laughs> Earthquake. <laughs> Her phone went off. We've got an earthquake and it's still going on. Yeah, let's have a look. Where is this? PS waves. It's reading. What do we have here? There we go. Oh, there it is. Look at this. Tochigi, magnitude 5.4. Tochigi, unusual, isn't it? I can't say that. Okay, quick, quick, quick. If you, I don't know if you can get to this page. This is a region blocked page, perhaps. That's the PS waves that are going out from where it is right now. That's the page. How about, was it? It says Japanese strength 5, magnitude 5.4, 60 kilometers down in Ibaragi Ken, the south area of Ibaragi. Hmm. 
Hmm. So you see the P and S waves, right? There's primary and secondary waves. The primary waves going out, humans can't feel. It's the secondary waves are the ones where we actually feel the, uh, feel the movement there. Oh, the earthquake and the, and the wind and yeah. oh, natural disaster. Actually, it was really funny. It's one of those days yesterday where we had all four seasons in the same day. You know, right, right, right. it was the morning was. Yep, you know, was morning. Yep, 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 yep. And, and then, then it went. It went, went to hell. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then all of a sudden, so. the sky became like really dark, and I was like, "What's going on?" Yeah, and it yeah, started yeah, raining yeah. and the wind. But it was like in summer you get this where it's a nice day and you get a thunderstorm yeah, comes yeah. through. This wasn't like that. It was the whole season changed. Season, you know, it was really, really bizarre weather strong, yesterday. So. Right. Dramatically. Hmm. So, okay. Wow. Hey, okay, let's, okay. Let's really let's give some consideration to, this, to the commuting thing, okay? Okay. And not just yeah, let's think about it, but don't do anything. Let's let's think about this. Okay. Okay. okay see you soon. I got a couple things to ask you about the things that happened yesterday, but uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So her phone went off. Weep, weep, weep. I don't have one of those. So <laughs> the thing is, so this time that earthquake was really not very far from here. We're talking about you know, it's split seconds. So in this case, the physical shaking and the alarm were pretty much simultaneous. So the alarm in that sense doesn't help us. But if the earthquake is some distance a little bit farther away, then you get your alarm before the shaking starts. So but we were shaking here, you know. I don't know. Did, did the lamp start to shake? I don't know. Not enough to make us decide to run outside. Of course we felt it. We felt it. I think we heard it first. I was sitting here and I heard some rattling, scraping in the, in the wall. And I thought I was sitting back on this thing making a noise. And it wasn't. It was the, the rattling of the structure. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interested. I'll look back on it later when we see the VOD, you know. Did, did the camera shake? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> okay, back to work here. A couple more minutes work before show and tell. Is that our first earthquake on stream? I don't think so. I think we've had that two or three times before, haven't we? For the mods, you could maybe you know, bookmark that page I showed, the PS waves, or maybe we could make a bot command for it. I don't know. I've got a bookmark in my browser, so as soon as I feel the shaking with me, then that's the first thing I do. I put my work down, I access that page, and it, it's instantaneous. It shows me the center of the earthquake, yeah, you know, as you saw it. So. That will also have been strong enough to stop the trains momentarily. All the subways would have stopped. The brakes would have come on. And they have a, a code system where, you know, they will have to check the tracks and stuff. So they may have just been able to restart quietly. And in some cases, when the earthquake is strong enough, they need a manual walk of the tracks to make sure nothing has been knocked out of kilter. My guess is that the trains would have stopped for that paused and then after a minute they would have just restarted slowly to the next station, I guess. And it's funny in the subway too because everybody's phone goes off. So you're just sitting there peacefully on the subway then all of a sudden Everybody's phone. Weep, weep. <laughs> Let's go. <get first>, so. <clears throat> oh, 
people, if somebody's mentioning in the chat there, they feel bad about accessing that page and maybe people who need the information can't get it, I don't think it's that kind of a page, you know. Remember, the only people accessing that page are the people who've already felt the earthquake. There's no, uh, you know, it's just for information purposes. The system itself, I'm sure, is very robust. You know. The only reason I access that page is, is curiosity, of course. It's not giving me any life-saving information. If the earthquake had been, uh, you know, some magnitude stronger, we'd have been heading for the door instead of sitting here looking at web pages. I guess it's time for our show and tell, is it? 9.15. Let's do this. So we have a couple of things here today. One of them actually looks a little big, but it's not. It's something that's in a large package, but it's not a very large object. I think I may be able to handle it here. If I shrink this down a bit here, we don't need my mug quite so big here. Okay, let's see if I can reach this thing. There's a package. Yes, 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 yes. This is something that we picked up a week or so ago on Yahoo Auction. And when I saw it, I thought, this is going to be so much fun. It's a print. It's a single wood block print. It's a hook side design. And it has meaning to me. Well, let's, let's, let's save that part of the conversation for after I open it up. Let's get inside here and see what we have. I don't think we're going to be able to salvage the plastic. I don't know. No. I want to recycle as much of this plastic as possible, but when they tape it up like this, Tell you what we'll do. Rather than cut all the plastic, yeah, someone's saying it's a match label print. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, not. Well, I'm gonna have to cut it. Oh. Oh, I see. He's taped the plastic to the newspaper. That's why it didn't come off. Oh, so is that layer one? Layer two, and we've got a box. Oh, it's just going to open. <laughs> more, more plastic. Welcome to Japan. Welcome to Japan. The excavation continues. Again, this is very, very common. The people who sell stuff and pack stuff like this on auctions, they are paranoid about being, uh, getting a claim for damage. So they will overwrap like crazy so that if something is wrong with it, plastic. 
thick. And does this count as another layer? Look, what have we got here? We have, <laughs> we have newspaper. How many layers are we down to? And we're not there yet. We have a very, very nice wood block print. And I was stunned when I bid on this. Nobody else bid on this thing. It came up on Yahoo Auctions uh, last week. And those of you who know my work, they know about this print. Oh, it's acrylic. It's not even glass. You could have thrown it down a football field. It wouldn't have broken. Anyway. <clears throat> I got this, I got this, I got this. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful wood block print. And we're not going to leave it in the frame. Let's see if we can get it out of here. The image is one that has meaning to me because I was hoping somebody would get this. I used it as the first print, the opening print in my currently ongoing series of prints, the arts of Japan. Okay, you're about to be liberated, young man. Here we go. Get that crap out of the way. It is a nicely made print, really. When I made my reproduction of this design years ago, I used a book illustration as the source because I didn't have the real print. And now we have the print itself. And this is a reproduction, presumably. There's no way this is going to be an original from Hokusai Zero. The paper doesn't look that old. And I had no idea that this print had ever been reproduced. <clears throat> My version was made from a book illustration of the original print. What we're seeing here are two dancers in what's called Kyogen. This is nothing to do with Kabuki. This is related to the No Theater. And the No Theater has uh, serious episodes. People wear the masks and they do the chanting and the declaiming. And then as, I guess, mm -hmm. as comic relief, it's not whatever, as a relief or as an interlude between the more serious episodes, dancers come on for a specific genre that's called Kyogen. I don't know too much about it, except that this is a Hokusai design of a well-known Kyogen dance, the name of which I do not remember at the moment. And this print is made very, very nicely. It's cleanly cut, beautifully printed. Look at the sharp edges here. On this, uh, on this color pattern. It's not microscopic level on the hair, but it's adequate. And the guy, the, dan the main dancer. So again, look at the hair. It's not microscopic. We could maybe do a bit better with the help of the scope, but this is fine. This is very good. And the gradations. Each one of the patterns on his kimono has a separate gradation. And when I first saw this image and I decided to use it for my series, I'm thinking, Dave, do you really, really, really want to do this? Every one of those gradations is a separate block, of course, and a separate impression. With, a, with some, well, they're going to be doubled up. This one and this one are going to be on the same piece of wood. And it can't be a single pass, but the guy would take his brush and go chuk a chuk a chuk chuk a chuk a chuk chuk a chuk a chuk So maybe the red one there has one block for three of them. This, uh, is it a dirty blue color? This could be on the same block as these two. Can't be on the same block as that one. So it's going to be one block, two blocks, purple, one, three blocks, four, whatever, four, maybe five blocks for the gradation areas there, and a whole bunch of impressions. This is embossing. Somebody says the gray lines around the collar, it's embossed there. There's an embossing block for this. So this is embossed. There's no color involved there. I think that seems to be the only embossing on the print. There was a separate block made just.
for that. Very nice. This at the moment is not available from us anywhere. There are maybe 70 people out there who have got my version of this. As I said, this was my first print. If you go to the website, not Mokohankan, if you go to woodblock.com uh, slash arts, I think. Let me see if I get the link here. Uh, this probably also won't work on a phone. I don't know. No, 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 not mokohankan.com. Woodblock.com slash arts. I think that's the link. And don't even bother on a phone because it's just going to be a disaster. So very happy to get this. And the other thing too, I was very, very surprised that nobody was interested in it, that nobody else seemed to want to get it. And it came up to me for, where are we here? Huh? Where are we here? can't find it. Here it is, 3,000 yen. Here's the link. Copy link address. Again, some European viewers maybe, I think Yahoo is blocking stuff, so this is probably not going to go in Europe. But there's the, uh, there's the auction page. And only one bidder. Nobody bid on this for 3,000 yen. I cannot, I cannot understand. Anyway, there it is. I'm quite happy to be the host for this print for the next 100 years or so. And actually, oh, it's not glued down. Okay, yeah, we can get rid of it right now. We can get, get it out of this frame here. I'll remove those later. Here we go. Here we go. I should have done that first. I will wash those tabs off later, but for now we can get it free from the frame. Very nice. It's liberated. I have no idea when this would be made. Looking at the paper quality and the general tone, <coughs> it doesn't look pre-war. My first guess would be 1960s, 1970s, of maybe an Adachi production, something like that. I don't know. Very happy to be the current owner of this print. Very nicely made. Some says, would well, the Japanese consider this a bit kitschy? I don't think so. This is a, a kyogen is a recognized arts in Japan. It's a recognized genre. There's no reason anybody would uh, be, be any reason to disrespect this at all. Okay, we've got that. We've still got a bit of time left, I think. Let's grab another one of these little boxes here behind me because I suspect, I think this one is relevant. Oh, green tape. <clears throat> I think this one is relevant to the pending thing. We had Otsue the other day. Remember the Otsue we showed you and I'm going to get back to you with more information on that. This one I believe is related to this. So let's open this and crack this and then we can look at them both together properly tomorrow. Tomorrow meaning Saturday. How long has it been since we had green tape? I don't know. It's still there in the shops. I have no idea why the people haven't been using it for our packages. That last package, you know, overwrap. This is a woodblock print and it's packaged. The damn thing folds in half. English newspaper. That's funny. Unusual. Notice here, this is uh, 
Calvin and Hobbes running in reruns in the Yomiuri newspaper here in Tokyo. Yes, yes, yes. Look, 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 look. It's more otsu-e. So we'll double these up. We'll tell you the same story now that I don't remember all the backstory for all these, but we will combine these with the prints that we saw on Monday. It's the same theme, remember? You saw this, right? Remember? The sharpening stone, the spear, and the spear being sharpened. This is the Kabuki play, Yanone, a reference. So we'll look at these together with the other ones. We're going to have the same themes. Oh, I can remember. I can't remember. It's, it's a, a priest walking with his lute, and it's an animal, a dog or a cat, pulling his sash. And it's all... I can't remember the story. Oh! No, I can't remember. I can half remember it. I'll get it wrong. There's a meaning to what's happening here. Okay. Oh, good morning, Mr. San. Hello, 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 hello. So rather than blab about it now and tell lies, let me look up the proper stories and we will, on Saturday, we will go through these things and talk about what these things all mean. And they're the same themes, you saw them to show. It's different carving, different, different uh, painting, different design. But these themes came around again and again and again. Oh, good morning, Ugao san Hello, the crowd is gathering. So here we are. Oh, there's a Wikipedia page for Otsui. Of course there is. Yes, yes, yes. And the falcon. The same as the ones I showed you the other day. What these are, they are woodblock prints for the black lines. The black parts are cut and very, very, very roughly printed. And the colors are splashed in by hand. We'll look at them again in a little more detail. And we'll talk about the backstories in the next stream, Saturday morning, two days from now. So that's enough for right now. I will still, of course, be carving on that same print. There's no way I'm going to be finished this by next Saturday, two days from now. Okay, thanks, gang. Thanks very much. I've had a good start to my day here. I'm ready now for a full day of work here at some of the different projects going on. See you two more days on Saturday morning. Thank you very much. What's happening outside? The garbage can still tipped over. Blue sky. Beautiful, beautiful blue sky all day today, I think. It's cold out there, right, guys? Is it still? It's still windy. Cold, cold. Still windy. Eh? So the flags aren't windy so much right now here, but I think over on Kokusai Dori it seemed, you know, quite, quite windy. Right? Mm -hmm. Did you feel the earthquake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the chat did too. So, <laughs> so. Okay, signing off. Three, two, one. Let's go down.